On August the 16th, 1942, there were two airmen whose task was to patrol the coast and search for Japanese submarines, then return to base. This was the last time the airmen were seen or heard from. Their airship or blimp was an L-8, which was part of the Airship Patrol Squadron 32. The airship was built in 1941 and commissioned on March the 5th, 1942. The airship had in its arsenal 30 caliber machine gun, 300 rounds of ammunition, and two 325 pound Mark 17 depth bombs mounted on an external rack. The airships were able to hover in place and would lower devices for surveillance in order to combat enemy submarines. The disappearances of the two crew members from the blimp in front of thousands of people still has no explanations. The missing airmen were Ensign Charles Adams and Lieutenant Ernest Cody. Both pilots were professionals and had extensive flight experience. Ensign Adams was 38 years old and had served in the USS Akron, the USS Macon and the USS Los Angeles. Lieutenant Ernest Cody was a graduate of the Academy of the Navy, whose mother-in-law stated that her son-in-law was a calm and balanced man. The Navy base was situated at Moffett Field in California and had an airfield on Treasure Island in San Francisco Bay. From there, blimps rose up to patrol the coast and search for Japanese submarines. One of these blimps was the L-8, which was part of the Airship Patrol Squadron 32. When the airship was ready for launching, they found wet fog had settled on the soft surface of the blimp, significantly weighing it down. Due to this extra weight, the mechanic was forced to stay on the ground, resulting in the blimp's crew size being reduced to just two people. When the problems were sorted, the airship was finally able to take off at 6.03 a.m. As the airship traversed the ocean below, at 7.44 a.m., Cody reported that a suspicious stain was found on the water near the Farallon Islands and announced that he was going to investigate a suspicious oil slick. Stand by. An oil spill could indicate a sign that an enemy submarine could be present. The airship dropped two Mark IV float lights and began to explore the area. The blimp circled the area of the slick for an hour. The drama was witnessed by sailors from the fishing trawler Daisy Gray and the ship Albert Gallatin, who later verified that the airmen had dropped smoke flares. On viewing this, the crew of the Albert Gallatin sounded the alarm and prepared weapons. The airmen continued to circle the slick at an altitude of 200 to 300 feet, which was witnessed by the first mate of the trawler, who was close enough to the gondola to describe in detail the two pilots. At 9am, the pilots threw off the ballast, rose and headed back towards San Francisco. The movements of the airship did not arouse any suspicion because the coast of California was regularly patrolled by blimps. Throughout the whole saga, air traffic controllers at Moffett Field had been keeping regular communications between the base and the airship. But at around 8.30 a.m., before the pilots had thrown off the ballast at 9 a.m., things had gone eerily quiet, and there was now radio silence. When the blimp was still silent at 8.50 a.m., two Kingfisher float planes were sent out to find it, as well as other aircraft in the area that had received warnings to report on a Navy blimp. At 10.49 a.m., the pilot of a Pan American airplane on its approach to San Francisco had noticed the blimps over the Golden Gate Bridge. A short time later, two more aircraft confirmed that they had seen the airship and everything looked in order. At 11 a.m., the blimp was seen soaring up at a sharp angle and disappeared into the clouds at an altitude of about 2,000 feet. This height was getting dangerously close to its limit, at which point its valves would open to release helium in order to prevent an explosion. Why were these experienced pilots now behaving in a risky and careless manner? At 11.20am, the airship was spotted over the coastal highway. The airship was also seen by an on-duty seaman called Richard Quam, who took a photograph of the blimp. He said the engines were not working. 
the gondola was empty and the shell would have filled with helium, causing it to partially blow off, resulting in the airship declining due to loss of gas. As the airship was now getting closer to the ground, two swimmers attempted to grab the hangar ropes to try and stop the blimp, but found it was too heavy. A short time later, the blimp hit a golf course, resulting in it losing one of the depth charges. Fortunately, depth charges only explode under the pressure of water. Unfortunately, this only resulted in the blimp taking off again, and finally coming to rest in Daly City, a suburb of San Francisco, where it damaged a car and houses. The outer skin of the blimp was tangled in wires and the gondola was almost standing upright. Without waiting for the authorities, the locals rushed to open the door of the gondola, hoping to rescue the men inside, only to find it empty. When the firemen arrived, they slashed at the envelope with axes, believing that they were trapped inside. Again, it was empty. When the military finally arrived on inspection, they discovered that there was a lot of fuel still in the tanks. They also located three parachutes, a single life raft, a machine gun, the pilot's personal weapons, a loudspeaker and a walkie-talkie. Everything seemed to be in place. One of the gondola doors was locked and the second was closed, but not locked. After an official inquiry, they found that the motors were still in working order. The control buttons were in the on position, although the motors would not have been working as it drifted above the ground. The radio was also working, but even if it had failed, the crew could have requested assistance from any vessel using the loudspeaker. The pilots could have parachuted to safety, but they were still intact in the gondola. The only thing missing was smoke bombs and life jackets, which the pilots would have been wearing. The commission into their disappearance suggested that the crew had accidentally fallen out of the open door. But if that was the case, how is it that both doors were closed? In addition, the military unsuccessfully searched the strip of land and the area of the bay over which the airship had drifted. Any bodies should have remained afloat since the vests the pilots wore inflated automatically upon contact with water. They then started to come out with wild theories of them having an argument with one fatally assaulting the other, throwing him out of the cabin and then escaping. Maybe they were shot by a Japanese sniper, but the wild accusations were all rejected. A witness and telephone operator called Ida Ruby came forward stating that when she was sitting on the beach, she witnessed the blimp drifting up from the ocean and swore that she'd seen three people on board. Then 17-year-old Edward Taylor, using binoculars, also witnessed people moving about in the cabin. Maybe this third man fatally assaulted the pilots and threw their bodies overboard. But experts claim that this was not possible as there was no place in the gondola where a third person could hide. Besides, the pictures that were taken while it drifted showed that the cabin looked empty. Thousands of people, and even the police, had witnessed the airship drifting across the skies, and all claimed that the cabin was empty, and would have seen their bright life jackets falling from the gondola. The investigators made the conclusions, and said that the sudden rise of an airship at 11am could only be caused by weight loss, such as the men falling out, and not by releasing excess helium from the envelope. Why did the pilot stop broadcasting if the radio worked? Why were the motors dead, even though the buttons were turned on? After the commission came up with no suitable theories as to what happened to the pilots, there were many other wild theories, such as that they were captured by a Japanese submarine. They were spying for Japan and escaped. A third person had managed to get on board, fatally assaulting them and fleeing. One of the pilots took the other's life over a woman and while disposing of the body, lost his own life. One year after the incident, they were officially declared missing. Experts believe that their bodies will never be found and they will probably never discover the truth of what happened. The airship itself did not sustain any serious damage and returned to service as a training blimp. After the war, it was returned to the company that built it.